Well, grace and peace to all of you, you beautiful, beloved Second Baptist Church in Liberty. And love and light to you, Jason and Christy and Jackson and L Jackson and Luke and Nora. Uh, it is so good to be with you today. Um, and, it's, and it's a joy to, uh, to see people that I have known, that Tim and I have known in various churches as we've moved around the country. Um, Connie and uh, Elena and Katie Jo, who was in the early service, and uh, Andrea, who has shepherded our invitation to be here and covered so many details. And oh my goodness, just lovely to be in this space with all of you. It was a great joy uh, for Tim and me to meet and get to know Jason and Christy years ago when we were in Waco. Uh, Christy and I were in a women's small group together. I think we journeyed with one another for a couple of years. We met every week in, uh, in our home and, and shared life together. And it was, it was just a joy. And then to stand at the altar with Christy and Jason 19 years ago and to offer a blessing on this obviously beautiful union. Uh, so. Thank you for this invitation. I said in the early service, Jason, you have been uh, the source of envy of many a pastor, in, uh, and not just Baptists. This amazing, Lily-funded four-month sabbatical is, is one of those once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. And so blessings on you, but also Second Baptist, your willingness to, uh, to allow Jason to step away and to breathe and to refill his lungs and, and his, um, his joy and to, you know, be with God in places that sometimes he might not otherwise be is a sign of your maturity and love and trust in the Spirit. So bless you for that. Um, you know, when you see a pastor uh, with the love and courage and vision and depth of Jason, and I must add Christy also to that, um, called to serve a church with the love and depth and courage and wisdom of Second Baptist, you just know the spirit is at work. Uh, so bless you all. And now in these moments, Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be one with your heart, O oh God, our liberator, our strength, and our joy. Amen. So the text that uh, Greg read just now from Luke's Gospel, every time I hear it, it catapults me back to my childhood. Uh, in 1969, our family was living in the tranquil days of pre-Disney World Orlando. Uh, my father was assigned to the Air Force Base nearby, and, uh, and we discovered that for some time, Walt Disney had been secretly or quietly buying up 27,000 acres of pristine orange groves and farmland about six miles from our house. Um, it was big news in Central Florida. But over at the little fundamentalist church that my brother and mother and I belonged to, the rapture was getting a lot more attention than the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> Down at the Sky Lake Baptist Church, obsession with the end times was growing. Now, um, while my agnostic father really was not into apocalyptic predictions, my mom could not get enough. And so our dinnertime conversations included talk of the Antichrist and trumpet judgments and speculation on whether Mrs. Jones, who lived next door and smoked Virginia Slims and drank Schlitz beer straight from the can, would survive the tribulation when the rest of us were caught up in the air. <laughs> I'm pretty sure my decision to give my life to Jesus was based partly on my genuine love for God. And, uh, but also partly because of the four horsemen, you know, the end times was scary business. It's just so ironic to me that these words today from Luke's gospel that point to the end of all things are meant to have the opposite effect. Nations will be in anguish and 
People will be perplexed and anxious, says Jesus, but, but, lift up your heads. Your salvation is way closer than you imagine. Why the hopefulness here? Because the end of history, the, the consummation of all of God's dreams for creation, uh, wears a face, and not just any face, but the very face of love. The, the face of the one who healed and taught and had children hanging from him like a, an opossum, and, and who gathered them into his arms and ate with outcasts. The same one who confronted the smug religious professionals and then turned and said to the sinners, I don't condemn you. Having a sense of who waits for us at the end helps us to make wise healing choices in the meantime. And in this passage from Luke, Jesus offers us a good place to begin. Did you catch it? Look at the fig tree, says Jesus. Look look at the fig tree, and all the trees, for that matter, when they sprout leaves. You know summer is, is on its way. In other words, according to Jesus, if you and I want to know what God is up to in the world, we can start by paying attention to what's right in front of our face. It's strangely comforting to me that even 2,000 years later, or 2,000 years ago, Jesus was reminding his followers to pay attention, to be mindful, to see, to really see what was in front of them. I want to hit the pause button for just a minute and ask you something. What is the first word that comes to mind when I say the word contemplative? All right, now feel free to turn to your neighbor for a minute. Kind of get that word in your contemplative. What springs to your mind? Turn and share for just a minute, please. You too. <laughs> Okay. All right. I think some of you are making plans for lunch. Stop now. And we'll <laughs> okay. All right. What are some of the words that, that came at? Contemplative. What? Prayer. Yes. Great. Anybody else? Connie. I said candles. Candles. Love it. Well, you tell you what Andrea said? Yes. What did Andrea say? Slow and boring. I love it. I love it. An honest soul. Thank you. Yes, I'm praying for you, Andrea. All right. <laughs> Contemplation. It's uh, from the Latin, contemplari, and it means to gaze, to behold, to observe. Put simply, a contemplative is simply someone who's learning to be fully present in whatever moment she or he happens to be. The 17th century Jesuit priest Jean-Pierre de Cassade wrote that when we are fully present with God, the soul is light as a feather, liquid as water, simple as a child, and easily moved as a ball by every inspiration of grace. Contemplation, to gaze, to behold, to observe. A contemplative is simply someone who's learning to pay attention to divine presence as Moses did when he said, you know what? I need to deviate from my path and go see why that burning bush is not burned up. That was a contemplative inclination in Moses. A contemplative is someone who's learning to listen beneath the noise as Elijah did outside his cave, straining to hear that still, small voice. Or as Mary did at the Annunciation, absorbing that angel's impossible words into her soul. That baby in you is going to be the Son of God, pondering, contemplating those words in her heart. 
And so if what we want to be is are people who live and serve and lead from that grounded place with God at the very center of things, well, there, there are some habits, there are some practices we can do to encourage that. But before I, I point us to a few, I, I want to say this. One of the beautiful things about contemplative Christianity, contemplative Christian spirituality, is that it is not about getting it right. It is about being present with God. And it's not about beating yourself up for getting it, quote, wrong. There is no wrong. You just gently bring yourself back to your center with God when you realize you've wandered off. Happens to me about a thousand times a day. In fact, my favorite mantra these days is this. Oops, pause, breathe, return. (laughs) When it occurs to me that my mind is anywhere but where I am in this moment, That's okay, oops, pause, breathe, return to God, return to that center. I am a flawed contemplative at best. I uh, most of the time feel like my friend Mary, who is a Lutheran pastor in North Carolina, who, like me, carries this internal scorecard around wherever she goes. She says that while she is meditating in the silence, praying in the silence, she is repeating this mantra, I'm failing contemplative prayer. I'm failing contemplative prayer. I mean, be gentle with yourselves. So this morning, I want to invite us to three particular areas of awareness. Notice these are not things we do. These are just areas of which to be aware. First, throughout the day, let yourself notice when the velocity at which you are moving and thinking exceeds your ability to be fully present. I happen to live in what is arguably the least contemplative city on the planet. Uh, Nobody comes to Washington, D.C. for the chill vibe, I assure you. Uh, You know, that, that... Uh, the words, I'm so stressed, I need to get to Washington to find some peace, has been said by no one ever. (laughs) But it's not just Washington, it's everywhere. You know, people everywhere, including many of you, I am sure, work so hard. And we all live in this rocket speed age. The thing is, friends, we all have wagon train souls If we're going to be present with the tasks, the people around us, and with God, we're going to have to tap into what the 20th century contemplative Gerald May called the power of the slowing, easing back the throttle, not just with our body, but also with our mind, which is constantly in motion, planning, anticipating, strategizing, compensating. I mentioned just now the challenges, some of the challenges, of life in Washington, but I do find this to be very ironic. The pace of urban life in some ways feels slower to me than when we lived in the suburbs or even in the country. And I think it has to do with the walking. Um, When we lived in Texas and in Atlanta, I necessarily drove everywhere. Inside my air-conditioned car, I zipped past neighborhoods and communities on my way to meetings or hospital visits, windows rolled up, music blaring. But D.C. happens to be a walking city. We actually, our family lives without a car. We do not own a car. Um, And so these days, I shine with perspiration like everybody else as I ride that huge escalator out of the DuPont Circle metro station. I always laugh. Some ambitious people, you know, jog up the moving stairs with their briefcase in hand and smartwatch tracking their heartbeat. I just step aside and cherish the slow pace. And one of the things I love most is that there's almost always some street musician at, uh, outside the metro next to the Krispy Kreme. 
and uh, I, well, I can hear their music while I'm still way down in the, in the metro tunnel. Um, there's my friend Manuel from Bolivia who plays his charango, this wonderful little stringed instrument you know. Or, or the old blues singer growling B.B. King or Percy Sledge. Or the young dramatic countertenor who, as far as I can tell, only knows Ave Maria. <laughs> and, and as I walk up Massachusetts Avenue to our church two blocks away, I try to remember to go slow, to pay attention to the feel of my feet on the pavement, every step grounding me in this moment, this breath, this face coming toward me on the sidewalk. And it's a gift. So be mindful, be aware of your velocity. Second, throughout the day, let yourself be aware when it occurs to you, you are operating primarily from your ego self. Now, I want to be clear, your ego is not your enemy. Your sense of self is, is it's a gift from God, and, and your, your ego helps you function in the world. And yet, when we identify with our ego self, um, as our ultimate identity, more than our grounded in God identity, then we filter uh, what we see and hear and say through that very narrow self-centeredness. How is this going to affect me? What's in it for me? What will people think of me if I do or say or post this or that? But see, when we live and listen and lead from our deepest, truest identity beneath the ego, deeper than the ego, then the work we do, the ideas we offer, the leadership we give, the, the conversations we have, the prophetic actions we undertake are then grounded in the healing, empowering, life-affirming presence of God the Beloved. So be aware when you're operating mostly from your ego self. The third and last area of awareness I'll mention is this. Throughout the day, pay attention when it occurs to you that you are operating mostly from your analytical mind. Now, just like the ego, friends, because uh, I, I know some of you are in academia, our mind, our rational analytical mind is not the enemy. Now, your mind is a gift from God. And the mind is relentlessly dualistic. It knows by comparing, opposing, judging, differentiating. In fact, some of us may be operating in this room that way even now without realizing it, you know. I like the sermon. I really didn't like that sermon. Sunday school blessed me. Sunday school bored me. I miss Jason's beard. What was up with that beard? <laughs> you know, it's like, this is how we operate. And, and our mind assigns, you know, binary labels, good, evil, right, wrong, highbrow, lowbrow, pro-life, pro-choice, conservative, liberal. And as long as we're aware of this, we can appreciate our rational mind for what it is, very helpful in, in very many ways, and yet completely inadequate for dealing with the big mysteries. God, grace, suffering, sexuality, death, love. Maybe this is why the church keeps tripping over these same issues again and again. And especially Baptists, Lord love us, we are black belt ninjas at binary thinking. We just are. Baptists love to fight it out, you know? But if we want to be fully present with God, our analytical, rational mind cannot get us there alone. And so, just to sum up, if we want to live from that grounded place with God in the center, we can pay attention when it, we find our velocity outpacing our ability to be present. We can pay attention when we find ourselves operating mostly from our ego. 
and we can pay attention when it occurs to us, we're operating mostly from our analytical mind. Look at the fig tree, said Jesus. Open your eyes and look. I wonder sometimes if the poet Mary Oliver was thinking of fig trees or burning bushes when she wrote, Belief isn't always easy, but this much I have learned, if not enough else, to live with my eyes open. So may I offer you a little assignment today? Young, old, this is not, it's not complicated. Um, it, it, it will challenge you, and it's simply this. As you move through the rest of this day, as you go to lunch, as you sit with your family later, as you get up from your nap, um, as you work through the week, practice being present in whatever moment you happen to be and with whomever you happen to be. That's it. And friends, there is such power in living this way. Be alive to this moment and to the one who holds it, Christ, who was and is and is to come and who's coming to us even now if we have eyes to see. I'd like to close this morning this sermon um, by teaching you a, a, a little chant. Um, chanting is a wonderful contemplative practice because it engages our thinking mind, our feeling heart, and our, our sensing body, all of us. You know, and, and the body is so important because the body is always present in this moment. Your mind can be all caught up in what's going to happen tomorrow or regretting what happened yesterday, but your body is always here and now. Um, so we're going to chant together this beautiful little snippet of Psalm 46. You know it very well. Be still and know that I am God. And I will sing a line, and then you repeat a line. And we'll learn it that way, and then we'll sing it through twice more. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I Be still.